So we're going to get going, I think, here. The coaches are ready. Got the whole staff here tonight. So welcome to the Men's Basketball Digital Town Hall. My name is Keith Hannon from the Office of Alumni Affairs and Development and Athletics. And this is, uh, we've got to be around 20 of these digital town halls thus far. Uh, we've really enjoyed hosting people like yourselves, alumni, friends, parents. It's a great way for us to engage with everyone who supports our programs and we appreciate everything you do for us. And I think you'll enjoy this opportunity to, to kind of get up close and personal with our coaching staff and a couple of our players. Just some Zoom 101 before we get going. Please keep your microphones on mute until the end of the show where we'll open things up. And if you're looking to ask questions, uh, you're gonna use the chat button and the toolbar at the bottom of your screen. Bring that up and put in your questions for the coaches. Now the coaches tonight have decided that uh, they're happy to take questions as we go. So if we're going through a topic and something really inspires you and you wanna ask some follow-up about it, go right ahead and we'll take your question in real time. Or if we don't get to it in real time, we'll get to it at the end. So put those questions in the chat. If you wanna to look to see who else is here and you have a hard time scrolling through all the video screens, you can use the participants button and you can actually do a search for names or it lists everyone alphabetically, I believe by first name. And to get that chat going, we always enjoy it if everyone who's watching puts your name, class year, and where you're joining us from. And that kind of gets the chat rolling and then you can keep up with it from there. You should see it start to illuminate and that's your cue that something new has been posted down there or a little number over the chat icon as well. So that's about it for me. Uh, thank you so much for joining us again. And if you have any uh, questions about alumni affairs or any of these digital town halls, you can contact any of us after the program. Somebody that was looking for Gary Munson, he just arrived. So say hi to Gary. All right, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to our head coach, Brian Earl. All right, th thanks Keith. Um, we appreciate everyone being here. Um, Let's make sure we stay uh, on top of the, the email chain. There's a few people who are hitting us up to try and get on. Um, but it's good to see a lot of familiar faces. Um, this is the Zoom world now. So um, it is, uh, it's getting a little more comfortable, but still not the best venue to do this. Um, my sarcasm probably won't uh, get the laughs that I'm used to. So I'm going to try to keep it as uh, straight and narrow as possible. Um, we want to just sort of, We'll have a couple things for you. Um, I don't want to speak too much, um, and we are open to hearing any questions during, um, but we're going to talk a little bit about this season, um, our staff, where we are, um, and then go through a little bit of uh, X's and O's, uh, specifically about Princeton, how we, we decided to guard them um, this year, um, and then talk a little bit about recruiting. Um, so we'll sort of get right into it. So you see on the screen right now, this is our staff. Um, John Jakes, class of 10. Alex Mumford, who's been here for two years. Clay Wilson's our third assistant, um, who this was his first season. Um, and then Kieran Hurley is our director of basketball operations, um, who sort of makes sure that uh, we know what we're doing and we get from A to B and everything in between. Um, and then Jay Andrus uh, is our strength and conditioning coach who works with our guys. He's the guy with the weight room in the background. Um, so uh, another person who, who's not coaching staff but um, does a lot for us is uh, um, Casey Williamson, who's our athletic trainer, um, not pictured. Um, so that's our, our staff and then including the, the guys on the team, that's basically our circle. Uh, of, of people in our, in our uh, team. Um, so to just begin with the, the season in review, one of the biggest things um, that we had been working on for years um, was getting a locker room area. Um, we, we had a locker room that um, 
was a was a place for us to to have lockers. We also had sort of bathroom facilities in there. And basically we went to John Webster and, and came to a lot of you to ask to, to make that place a, a bigger area for our team to congregate. So now we have what we call a locker room area where you can see in the picture, the guys are congregating on the right hand side. Um, and at the top, this is, that's the locker room area. And then we have um, a study area, which is, I'm obligated to say study area per Cornell regulations. Uh, but it's a bit of a lounge area, which you see uh, the high top table uh, chairs on the left hand side. Uh, the lower middle picture, uh, and then our Cornell basketball graphic on the lower left. And so this uh, has, has done a lot for us. It, it is, again, a place for us to feel comfortable as a team. Our guys are there all the time. They can study uh, in that study area, but may, mostly it's to get them to the gym and feel comfortable with a place to work out. It also is where we congregate before games, a comfortable place after the game to talk through things. And so a lot of people on this call did a lot to get this done. It wasn't the smoothest process. Uh, we ran into the beginning of this um, fall semester and we had a ton of athletes outside of basketball whose blood pressure went up a little bit because we were able to, to put a nice locker room in Bartels. But, Many, many of you are, are, um, should be thanked, and we have thanked you in the past, and it is something we're really proud to sort of show to you guys here tonight a little bit through pictures. Uh, next thing, so just to talk a little bit about the season, uh, not my favorite subject. We were seven and 20. We struggled uh, uh, quite a bit in, in um, many games this year. The, the thing we have noticed and the thing that's important to us right now is when a team struggles, we, you tend to see cracks in, in the culture of things. And we're proud to say we didn't see any cracks as it came to our, our team. We um, have a strong culture that we're building on. What we have noticed is <clears throat> in games, try to stay with me here, but with under four minutes, and the game within six points, either us ahead or, or us down, we were one and six in those games this year. And so we had a lot of games, including games we were up 15 points in the second half. We were up in most of our games in the second half of the, the uh, basketball game that we managed to lose. And so we've done a lot to try to try to talk about that. We were planning on doing a lot to try and talk about that when COVID sort of wiped our season out. Um, but we noticed that we could get to the finish line. We just couldn't cross it as a team. And so some of the things we've been doing with the team is sort of resilience training, talking about um, various uh, situations that we were in, we, we talked about our seven close losses where we were our six close losses in those seven games. The one game we won was the Princeton game, the last game of the season, when we were within six, we were up six with about two to go. And we made that uh, really hard to win. Um, but we talked about a team Brown that was in their tight games were seven and one sort of a, uh, a, uh, a team that you could compare to us that we finished in fourth tied in the last two seasons, they were able to finish out those games. And we sort of want to address that as one of our major weaknesses. Um, and so with that Princeton win, hopefully we've turned a corner a little bit in that regard, but as the record shows seven and 20 is not great, but we see a lot of promise in sort of those close games if we can learn how to win those in the end. Um, Next slide, I think we'll talk a little bit. Um, John, maybe you can talk a little bit about uh, connecting with alumni. Yeah, thanks coach. Um, good evening, everyone. I appreciate you guys joining us. Um, you know, like during the course of any of our seasons, we always try to, to do our best, get creative, 
um, giving our guys opportunities to to engage with alums like yourselves and, and especially former players and vice versa. You know, I think as a former player, uh, I think the rest of the staff agrees that's a huge part of the Cornell basketball experience, right? Like making sure our guys are able to not just know names, but like put faces to names and get to know alums and what they're doing now and how they're so passionate about Cornell. Um, so you can see here in this photo, I think this is before our Harvard game this year. Um, Matt Morgan, I think Matt's in the in the chat now, but caught up with him before a shoot around. Um, obviously, we're we're really proud of how he's doing. Just finished his first season of professional basketball uh, with the 905 Raptors, the uh, the Toronto Raptors G League affiliate. So we're really excited about his future. I think it's even cooler how proud Matt is to be a Cornell graduate, right? And how passionate he is about the program. He's become like an awesome ambassador, like many of you are already, Matt's become an awesome ambassador for the program in the university. So that's been fun to see how passionate he is about us and our success. Um, no, no one's more passionate about Cornell basketball than Gary Munson. I think, I think Gary made his way into the chat. I hope he did. Um, this is, you know, if you played Cornell basketball, if you wore a jersey in the last 20 years, you went to, to one of Gary's dinners in New York. Uh, before the Columbia game, evening before, and it's become, you know, more and more popular every single year. Um, the guest list, you know, it rises every year. This year, uh, a few of my former teammates were able to join, which was awesome for me. And then um, in the picture, you can see in the middle, Mark Tatum, uh, the deputy commissioner of the NBA, who's not actually a basketball alum. He's a former baseball player, but still, it's important for our guys to like I said, connect with um, Cornell people who are passionate about their time at the university and obviously doing big things now. So that was, you know, a pretty awesome opportunity for our guys to, to get to know Mark and ask him questions. And the question and answer session went long, but it was, uh, it was fun and, you know, deep and thoughtful. Um, so that was a good time. A couple of years ago, uh, before our game at Toledo, we did a similar dinner with one of our, um, another passionate supporter, George Chapman, uh, in his hometown of Toledo, similar thing. Like we're always seeking out opportunities to, to make sure our guys know the people who came before them. Uh, and speaking of that, uh, I'm sure many of you know, this year we honored, um, you know, two of the greater teams in, in Cornell basketball history, the 1988 Ivy championship team and uh, the 2010 Sweet 16 team, which was my senior season. Uh, so you can see here, you know, the, the 88 crew and a few of my guys talking to our guys that shoot around. Um, you know, one of the better things for me, honestly, was watching this ceremony. Of course, it was uh, helped by getting a win over Princeton at home, which was awesome, but watching the 88 guys and the 2010 guys and our current guys all getting to know each other for about an hour and having legit genuine conversations and catching up and that's the stuff that's pretty meaningful right i think as a former player like i said it makes your experience richer deeper um and we're you know as a program as a coaching staff committed to doing this as much as possible every single year so that that stuff happened this year kind of closing our season in review but um again just really appreciates um, all of our alums, you know, basketball, former players or, or not, who um, are so passionate about this place. All right, so uh, just to add on to that, you know, a few people, um, George Chapman was someone who hosted us in, in Toledo. Um, I can remember my first or second season here going out to um, Southern California where we played a pretty tight game and just being blown away uh, by the amount of alums that uh, showed up to support us. Um, so it's a really strong, really strong presence. Um, I, I should have mentioned, and, and someone that had mentioned also Chuck Rolls, who um, gave to, to the locker room the previous time. I had a chance to, um, he was a great player, I think in the 50s. Um, I had a chance to meet with him a little bit before he passed away, unfortunately, but he was someone who did so much for the program. Um, and uh, he sort of drove me 
you know, he, he, he was a little older at the time, but, but drove fast in his golf cart around the golf course in Southern California. And uh, it was great to, to meet him, um, to know how much he, he took with him, uh, with the program. Um, so with that said, uh, we wanted to do a little bit uh, with regard to what a, a strategy is for us. The, the, the Princeton team, we were 2-0 and against Princeton this year. Um, but sort of put you in a chair as a, as a student athlete for, um, you know, these guys are asked to do a ton in the classroom. Um, and we asked them to do as much uh, physically and mentally on the court. So we want to talk a little bit about how we developed our, our Princeton um, scouting report. So one of the main problems, so Princeton uh, has had Richmond Ariragozo, who uh, was a was a first team all league center this year. He was second team last year. Uh, so I just threw this together, but to give you an idea of how we get a message across to our guys. So under under Richmond here, um, the problem part of him and starting with six foot nine, two hundred thirty five pounds is a problem. And uh, for us, Josh Warren was our starting center this year. He likes to call himself six, seven or six, eight, but we're thinking he's more six, six. Um, and so that his 12 points per game, his 7.4 rebounds per game and his field goal percentage at 61% is something going into Princeton. We said, what are we going to do about this? Are we just going to have Josh battle this kid? And at a certain point, physicality might get the better of you. Hopefully Josh, Josh, you did a great job, but you're smaller than him if you're on the call. Um, <laughs> so we sort of looked at that and, and said, with Josh and our backup center, Kobe, who, who had been injured, Kobe Dixon, for a little bit of the Ivy season, we didn't know if we wanted to go head-to-head -head with a guy that size. So we sort of looked on the opportunity side. Um, and in the last two seasons, you see here that um, – Richmond had a bit of a problem with what we call assist to turnover ratio. You know, sort of the great players in basketball can get to two, three to one assist to turnover ratio. Richmond this year was at 60 assists to 85 turnovers. Um, and the year before, 33 assists to 56 turnovers. So there, there's a bit of a, um, an opportunity there to guard him rather than one-on-one -on -one as a team. So with that said, we had a, a number of guys in the league this year. The co-players of the year were both six foot nine and six foot 10. Richmond from Princeton um, was, was six foot nine and, and a load. And there were a number of guys that we didn't necessarily want to go one-on-one uh, -on -one with. So what we did was, we sort of looked at what he does to, to players when he gets the ball, and hopefully everyone can see this, but this was our first game against him. And you see, he was probably the best post scorer in the league, a lot of its size, but a lot of its footwork. So big guys tend to, you call them left shoulder or right shoulder, but <clears throat> he finishes with either hand at the rim, and when he gets it in tight, He's pretty much scoring at the rim. So as a team, we we sort of said, let's not um, let's not guard him straight up. So we came up with a couple different doubles of the post. Okay, so um, one way we did it was. So this was our game at Princeton. Josh Warren is sort of near that ugly shield in the middle of the lane there. We put him on um, their point guard, who's the guy sort of right in front of the referee. So there's about a foot difference height there. We put Josh on a guy named Jose Morales. And in this instance, Josh is going to run at Richmond, their big guy, so that he doesn't score on our big guy, Colby. And you see in this one, part of the, the point is that 
it's not just the double, it's all the guys in the background who have to take care of helping. So we screwed it up a little bit and the guy who scored 30 points against us gets three. But you see again, we, we send Josh here and then we all scramble out of it and you see the bench sort of clapping that we did the right thing. And then here he goes into his move. He hasn't scored much. We're up 10. Um, and we're coming with Riley Voss. And we get him to travel. So that was one way. The second way we doubled them was just with the guy, the guy's man who threw it in. And so this whole time as you're, you're doing a chess match with the other team, Richmond is getting used to, well, Josh is coming to double me. And so once in a while we just say we call a different – pattern and we double with the guy uh, who's guarding the ball and he throws it away and then the third way is we come from the baseline so Jimmy Beheim comes from the baseline ball goes in and everyone reacts Jimmy comes from the baseline and then we run and get out of it and we're back in position here, the same thing at home. Jimmy Beheim comes from the baseline and it's stolen. And Marcus Fillion comes from the baseline and he, and he sort of throws it away. So that's just sort of a, a, a taste of what we did against Princeton. We did it against the other bigger teams as well. We had some success with Yale. Penn was a problem because their guy was a very, very good passer. Um, and so, like I said before, a lot of that is knowing who's doubling, but the, the three other guys on the court need to know their job as well. Uh, we did a pretty good job of that against Princeton, but, you know, you, you, as a coach, you see everything from the sideline. As a player, if you're locked into guarding your guy and all of a sudden it's thrown to Richmond in the post and – this time it's supposed to be a guy coming from the baseline. Um, there's a lot of um, constructive criticism that can come from us <laughs> as to um, what your job was on that play. Uh, and so these guys, the guys that we have really buy into exactly what our scan report is. Princeton was probably the best example of how we as a team sort of shut down a first team all Ivy kid very, very good player, very unselfish player, but a little bit of his weakness was seeing the court after he dribbled the ball. And we tried to, as a group, um, take advantage of that. And, and most of the credit goes to the guys just sort of buying into that. So that's, that's what a scattering report would be a little bit on that for, for a game plan for Princeton. That would be one point we would try to do against Princeton and, and was probably our most successful thing that we we did to an individual player this year. Keith, I don't know if we have any pertinent uh, questions on that at all. If anyone has a question, just feel free to chat. So uh, we have, uh, what's the, how does uh, Jimmy B know to come from baseline to guard him there? So we have calls. There may be Princeton people on this call, so I'm really worried about what our calls are. But, um, um, you know, prior to the play, we will yell it. And part of what our guys do is they have to be vocal about it. So if we say we called it uh, one, we would, we would put that call in either on the offensive end or during the defensive possession. And all our guys immediately click into – we're in double from the baseline side. And that is different than, than a specific person doubling because as there's movement in the half court, you might be at the top of the key and your guy cuts and now you're the double guy and you just went from having to do one thing to now having to go double from the baseline side. So um, as I said before, it's, it's, it's no picnic. It's, it's not easy. You need to get eight to 10, 12 to 12 guys to know exactly what their, um, their assignment is on any given situation that occurs throughout a possession. 
Um, and so there's a lot on a lot of those guys' plates, uh, but they, they buy into it. So we were happy with that. Um, so the next thing we wanted to sort of touch on was, you know, what we, so COVID has thrown the world into sort of disarray. Usually for the past month and a half, we'd be able to work out our guys in varying uh, groups. We could have a full practice if we wanted to. We could have two or three guys, um, but we weren't allowed to do that. So what we did this season was um, we gave them report cards in essence. And so this was, hopefully we can all see this. Uh, this was the report card of an anonymous player that was sent to him. And then we sort of talked it out on Zoom with this player. Uh, so each player was sent home with a report card. Now, our coaches, uh, some of our players may think they don't do much, but we video every practice, we video every game. And one of the things that we pushed for initially when we got here was to sort of upgrade our video capabilities. Um, and what we do behind the scenes to every practice and every game is we will code the practice, which means uh, each, each assistant coach has a little part of either offense or defense or little subjective things that they're looking for when we practice in a five on five situation. So um, we, it, it, you know, on defense, something that you do not want to happen is for the man who's guarding the ball, that guy who he's guarding just fly right by him something we call a blow by. So if that happens to a person on the team twice in practice, we can code that, meaning we will push a button and it'll record that clip so that if, um, you know, Jimmy, I'm picking on Jimmy, but if Jimmy gets blown by, it'll have a two second clip of, of uh, Josh catching the ball and driving right by Jimmy and scoring a layup. And so we will code that as a blow by. We have things like deflections where a guy gets a hand on the ball, even if we get it back or not, if he gets a hand on the ball, um, we're, we're coding that. We're seeing that, we're pushing a button that, that says it's deflection. Um, there's more subjective things where if, if we feel like somebody should have been the help person in that situation, we will say, well, Brian should have been in the help situation on that. So we will code that as Brian missed his assignment. And then it's on the offensive end also. So a good pass or an off pass is something we code. Um, needless turnovers, et cetera. So there's probably about 25 things we try to code every day in practice and every game. Um, and so that leads to this part of, uh, of our report card. Now, as you can see, we sort of have an offensive category, a defensive category, and there's also a strength and conditioning category. Um, and Jay, Andrus, maybe you can talk a little bit about the strength and conditioning piece of this. Sure, thanks coach. <clears throat> um, you know, uh, in terms of strength and conditioning, you know, this is really my prime time uh, with the guys. Uh, you know, the off season, unfortunately, we're missing out on that at this point in time. So these report cards are really vital uh, to the success and to our guys hitting their goals of summer training. Uh, you know, we have team goals. We also have individual goals. Um, you know, I'll talk a lot about intensity and consistency. Those are two key variables. You know, intensity, how hard we work every day. Consistency, doing that over time. That's what's really good, what's going to cause adaptation to the body and, and, and get these players, uh, you know, to, to cause these adaptations that, that we're identifying that they need you know, to be better on the basketball court. And, you know, looking at this report card here, this individual in particular, uh, this individual is a hard gainer. Um, you know, athletes respond differently. And this particular athlete has to really work hard to make gains, um, you know, anything physically related. So, you know, kind of, if you look at this, you see a 26 inch vertical jump. Um, that's usually a good indicator of, of how much power an athlete has. 
Um, so this athlete's really going to have to work hard. Uh, this athlete in particular uh, is a skilled basketball player and an average athlete. So we have to do everything we can to have the athleticism pay off on the court. So, you know, kind of the scouting report here is be consistent with strength training. Um, an athlete that's a hard gainer like this can't afford to take time off. Um, improve overall strength. So when you see an athlete with like a 26 inch vertical jump, um, that athlete is probably gonna have a greater impact with just getting stronger at this point in time, rather than converting to power and doing more explosive type movements. Um, you know, we want this athlete to keep their lean mass roughly where it is. Uh, again, come back in great shape, uh, really blow away the conditioning test. Uh, again, not really add a lot of lean mass, but not add fat mass. So, you know, a goal of under 8% body fat. Um, and that's kind of the scouting report from the strength and conditioning end on this particular athlete in terms of, you know, hitting those, uh, those improvements that Coach Earl and the rest of the staff wants them to hit on the court. And so if you, if you move for, for this, um, this particular player, um, and each of these report cards was designed based on um, what the, the individual person needed. So we sort of took the polls of, of, you know, what they did really well, what they did poorly, and sort of presented it to them. And, and so sometimes um, that may be um, very objective. Um, with this athlete, we, we presented him with sort of his game versus his practice stats was something that we said, well, um, as you can see in the upper left offensive practice stats, he's at 51%. In the game, he's at 40%. Three-point field goal percentage, 44, which is pro close to the top of the team. In games, he's 32. Assist to turnover, which is a, 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 for a guard is a really good indicator of you trying to make things happen while well, he's two and a half in practice and a little over one in a game. And then the turnovers are more in the game than they are in practice. So we sort of hammered home with him offensively that you need to make things happen uh, in the game a little bit more than what you're doing. Uh, defensively, you see this, this kid was third highest on the team in deflections, which means he gets a hand on a ton of passes. He, he bothers people by hitting the ball here and there. Now he's third on the team, third in a bad way of getting blown by what I explained before, where a guy just grabs the ball and goes right by him. Um, and then checkouts is something we call when you sort of lose track of what you're supposed to do, how you're supposed to rotate, how you're supposed to help. And so you can sort of paint a picture of a, a guy who's pretty good instinctively messing up people's offensive game, but when you need them to sort of get and stay in front or do the right thing immediately in a team setting, um, he needs to improve that. And so below that, we have improvement plans um, that we try to give them, uh, which you can read through. Um, and then we have uh, sort of the numbers of specific drills we do in practice where they need to to hit on a pretty regular basis. Now, five minutes shooting is basically having a ball and just shooting three pointers the whole five minutes by yourself, which is pretty grueling. So 40 is a pretty good shooter. Uh, Coach Jakes is probably at 42. I'm probably at about 43 on that. Um, <laughs> and uh, the rest of the drills are just uh, sort of for us. And then if you go to the next athlete, this is a different different athlete. And so, uh, Jay, I think I can sort of take it over, but this is a more athletic body. A 31 inch vertical leap. Jay wants him to sort of maintain a little bit more what he is. Um, for us, on the offensive side, what we saw from this kid was the first 14 or so games of the season, um, the points per game were low three-point field goal percentage was very respectable, but the attempts he took were, were just over one per game. And then you see in the Ivy League that those numbers sort of explode. And so our, our, our message to this athlete is do the Ivy League thing all the time. 
And then defensively, you see what we say is stop percentage, which is when somebody tries to take you one-on-one, -on -one, how often do you stop him from scoring? And he was one of the better guys on our team in, in that category. Points allowed, he's uh, one of the better. And then struggles a little bit on help, okay? And so we, you know, put into improvement plan, be ready to think about trying to help a little bit more next year. Go home and watch some basketball and see how help defense happens and still maintain sort of your locked in guarding the man in front of you, but make sure you impact the game away from it as much as you do on the ball. And so we, we gave these to our guys uh, as they left and talked to them on Zoom. Um, I think it helped that some of the guys who didn't play so much probably didn't realize that we were, we were sort of cutting up the video all season long. Um, and so we watched all the video. We watched the first guy on, on the court through the, the last guy and sort of presented them with you know, in practice, you're getting blown by the most on the team. And so they saw those statistics so that they can go home and, and really practice what they need to, to dig into. Uh, Coach, I have a question. It, it seems like it might make a little bit of sense that a player's carryover to the game, they might see a little bit of a dip in, in real game action against varying opponents versus their, their own teammates. Is there a standard dip that you don't like to see them go beyond or, or do good players actually not dip? Yeah, I mean, this, this is sort of our um, first time doing this. Uh, for, the, for the most part, you know, I think what you want to see is, is um, them being uniform when they, when they get into a game. Um, we, we had guys who, who shot it great in practice. And then when game, the game came around in the beginning of the season, they shot at 10 percentage points worse. And so, um, you know, we, a lot, if the story needed to be told that they need to be consistent from practice to game, we would say that like the first athlete here. Um, if the story was you need to be uh, less – Turnover prone in a game, they would see that on their report card. So um, I'm not sure what the the actual um, correlation is uh, for o most athletes. I will tell you that you know Matt Morgan scored in practice and shot it the same way he did in games. And Stephen Julian, who was one, a great defender of us for us, he guarded in practice the same way he did in games. So why don't we uh, move into, uh, is it recruiting now? Yeah, I'll take that over. Okay, so we're just going to talk about a lot of guys we, we're very excited about. Um, we, we added a few guys to this class. You'll see almost all the highlights are dunks. Um, so I'm hoping we see 90% field goal percentage next year with all the dunks we'll see. <laughs> Yeah, so first for me, guys, I just want to say thanks for, for joining this. Um, thanks for your support of Cornell Men's Basketball. Um, just scrolling through this, I've got to know some of you guys, um, and I'm, I'm looking forward to getting to know more of you as the time progresses. But uh, like Coach said, we want to show you guys some of the film, um, some of their highlights, but also talk about these young men and where they're from. Um, so first, we're going to introduce Chris Mannon, 6'5 uh, guard. He's from Montvale, New Jersey. Um, Chris was 16 years old when he was a senior. Um, in high school. So he kind of flew under the radar a little bit, um, but went on to, um, to play prep school at uh, St. Thomas More. And the coach there is Coach Jerry Quinn. He's a Hall of Fame coach. And so we were re really excited. I got to see Chris play um, in Philly during an AAU tournament um, and just kind of got to watch him progress throughout the year. And so if we could get that film um, going here in a second, I'll just tell you a little bit about him as a player. He, he's someone who is very versatile. Um, he's got a good size and good frame for his position. Um, he's able to guard multiple positions and kind of switch on to different different people. Um, Karen, Karen, do I need to start the film or share my screen? Okay, is it working? Okay, so we'll show you some of his highlights right here. 
Um, but as you can see, he's, he's really good at getting out in transition. Um, Chris, to me, has some of the best anticipatory skills that I've seen um, in a high school prep school player. I was watching one game where he had 10 steals in one game, and that's something that doesn't happen very often. Um, I'm not sure if this film is, is working for you guys, but hopefully you can kind of get a picture. Um, he's someone who I think has high major athleticism. Like Coach said, he's, he's very good at, at dunking, as you can see right here. Um, something that we really like about Chris as well is his ability to pass. He, he's got a, a very good vision, um, and he can, he can kind of see things before they happen. And, you know, the way we play, we like to play together. And having a, a guard who's able to defend, to dribble, to pass, to have good court vision is something that we're really excited about. And something that Chris is working on um, during this coronavirus and, and while he's at home is just extending his, his range. Um, he's working on a shot a little bit. Um, from the mid-range as well as from the three-point line. But he's a really, really good downhill driver and someone who, who had a, a storied high school and prep school career and we're really excited about. Um, this next player, if we can move on to the next one, is uh, Evan Williams. He's from Plano, Texas. Um, he started for them three years. He was three, three times all district in the largest school in Texas, uh, which says a lot. You know, uh, Evan is somebody who's six foot seven and, and has a college body already. Um, he's coming in and he, he met with Jay on his recruiting visit and fell in love with the weight room. Um, but he's someone, as you can see right here, who's able to dunk pretty much every time he touches the ball close to the rim. Um, he, brings, he brings great size and athleticism and he's able to get rebounds outside of his area. He's a very hard worker. Um, one thing that he's working on is, is Evan played a lot of zone in his high school. In his AAU team, he played a little bit more man, um, but Evan's working on his lateral quickness and just being able to be more versatile and, and switch on to bigs, switch on to guards. And someone who Coach mentioned earlier, Steve Julian, is, is someone we could see Evan becoming like on the defensive end. Um, he is able to shoot threes. He, he's working on that part of his game, just be, making it more consistent. Um, but Evan's a great young man, like I said, and, and we're really excited about him. Uh, in all aspects of his game. One thing that his AAU coach and his high school coach really rave about is his ability to pass as well. And if you know our offense and our style of play, um, being able to pass out of the high post is something that we really ask our bigs to do a lot. And Evan is a, is a good passer, but he's also a um, willing passer. And that's something that's really important to us as well. So those are two guys, uh, two of our six. I'm gonna let Coach Jakes talk about the next two. But again, thank you guys for your support of Cornell basketball. So the next guy up, um, Sean Hansen. So he's 6'8", 6'9", uh, forward center from Ramsey, New Jersey. Uh, so Ramsey High School. He graduated uh, as the program's all-time league scorer um, and led them to a sectional championship this year. And so you can see he's another uh, bouncier guy. Um, so that's exciting. But probably even more exciting is being that tall but versatile enough to guard someone at half court and, and guard smaller guys. That, that left-handed pass off the dribble in transition is something that most bigs can't do. Um, so like he mentioned, great passer, can shoot clearly, good low post fo footwork. We're excited about Sean. Our next guy up, um, whenever the slide turns, we can see it, is Keller Boothby. Um, originally from Plano, Texas as well, but last year he prepped at Wilbraham and Munson Academy uh, near Springfield, Massachusetts. So he won a NEPSAC championship last year. Um, elite shooter, like high, high level shooter with good size, six, seven, good length, drills shots from three, which obviously um, is important for any program right now. Um, great shooter, elite size for being a shooter and also a pretty good passer too. Um, he, to be able to see the floor, good vision, like Coach Wilson mentioned, it's pretty much a requirement for most of our guys to be able to see the floor and make plays. Um, video's not playing now, but he's, you know, pretty skilled for his size. So we look forward to adding that to our roster. Next up, thanks, Coach Jakes. Uh, we have Isaiah Gray. Uh, he's a 6'3 guard from Brooklyn, New York. Uh, you know, we're, we're super excited about Isaiah. You know, he's super uh, dynamic uh, and he experienced a lot of success uh, this past season at Cushing Academy. 
Uh, you know, they finished ranked number one uh, in the NEPSAC AA. Uh, and if you're familiar with the NEPSAC uh, conference, it's one of the best uh, leagues in New England. Uh, and in route to that, you know, Isaiah was a all league, first team all league NEPSAC uh, AA. Uh, so we're excited about him. And I think that's a testament not only to his ability, but his approach. Uh, this kid is an everyday guy. Uh, he's a kid who wants to come in and compete and get better every day. Uh, you know, and, and one thing that our staff, we're excited about him uh, is his vers versatility, you know, on the, def on the defensive end. Uh, he should be able to guard multiple positions. Uh, he will be intense and tenacious on the ball defending. Uh, he will be able to anticipate passing and get in passing lanes uh, for steals. Uh, and he's a great teammate. You know, we're excited about uh, just the value that he'll add to, you know, our program, just being a good teammate, uh, being a, a guy who's committed to doing the things uh, that are that is best for our program. And ne next up, uh, we have Darius Irvin. He's also from Brooklyn, a uh, 5'8 guard, uh, you know, and he, he experienced a lot of success. Uh, he finished his prep school career at Northfield Mount Hermon. And uh, for you guys that don't know, Northfield is one of the perennial uh, prep basketball programs in the country. Uh, you know, they consistently bring, produce high level college basketball players, uh, high level Ivy League players. And Darius is at the top of that list. You know, he's the all time winningest player at that school. Uh, he's experienced two championships in NEPSAC AA. Uh, and this past season, uh, he had a lot of success. He was a 50 50 90 guy. Uh, and when I say 50 50 90, that's 50% from the field, like so on two point uh, shots. Uh, he was 51% from three point, from behind the three point line on 124 makes. And he made 90% of his free throws. Uh, so we're super excited about this kid. Uh, he'll be a, a great locker room guy, uh, a guy who's committed to getting better every single day. Uh, and just like, you know, all of our guys, we're, we're excited about this class. Uh, we take a lot of pride in identifying and evaluating not only guys who fit how we play, but guys who embody the things that we value. Uh, so we're confident that these guys will appreciate the opportunity to wear a Cornell uh, basketball jersey and we represent us well, not only on campus, but in the uh, Cornell community. Uh, but up next, we'll have two of our, our senior captains, uh, Terrence McBride uh, and Jimmy Beheim. They'll answer a few questions for you guys. And I think that'll be narrated by, by Keith. Thanks, Alex. Uh, real quick, Coach, we had a couple questions on the recruiting front. Uh, one comes from Candace Van Gorder wondering, how do you rate this recruiting class compared to previous recruiting classes? I think you're, you're excited about all your recruiting classes. Uh, you see Jimmy and Terrence on your screen right now, and we were excited about them. Um, and, and Terrence produced an all Ivy season, and Jimmy, without an injury, probably would have as well. Um, along with their classmates. Um, so, you know, you do the work in recruiting uh, and, and you're realistic about um, what they can all bring. The guys we're bringing in, we're excited about. Um, they, they are dynamic. You can see that they can dunk. Uh, highlight films are not always the, the greatest indicator, but they can do some things. So we're extremely excited about adding them to our previous recruiting classes, which we we're excited about and think they have done um, very, very well in these situations. This year, you know, Josh, Josh Warren was, was a freshman in my first year. Uh, he, he was the only player in that class. And so that class has come up with me. We added some junior college talent to that. And so that, that was a bit of a smaller class, but we are excited. We think they can play they're going to be competing against these guys that are on the screen right now. So um, that's the, that's the way it goes. So we're excited in general about the way things are going and, and who we have and who we have coming in. And the answer to this question might be about the same, but uh, this is from Harry Pacheski from the class of 1959 wondering, have we recruited any game changers? <laughs> yes. Um, <laughs> you just don't know who they are, you know, uh, um, we're excited about all of them, you know, and, and, um, it's funny, the guys you think are game changers sometimes don't work out like that. And the guys who 
um, you think would be a nice piece turn out to be game changers. So we think we've recruited game changers. I just can't tell you who they are. Uh, I know that the guys um, who we're bringing in are tough. They work hard. They listen to their coaches through all the sort of um, research we've done with the people that surround them. Um, and we're excited about adding them to, to the program. So um, there's a game changer in there right now. I can't tell you who it is. All right. Thanks, Coach. Well, let's shift over to a couple of players we know are game changers and Jimmy and Terrence. Uh, thank you both for joining us and uh, hope you're doing well in, during this state of quarantine. Definitely, definitely. Thank you for having us. Yeah, thanks for having us. And um, just wanted to say thanks, everyone, for the support. Um, it means a lot to us and hope everyone's doing well. Great. Thank you both. And so we're, we're quickly approaching the 8 o'clock hour, but I want to make sure we get a chance to hear from both of you. Uh, I'll start with you, Terrence. Uh, in, the, in the process of looking at where you wanted to play at the next level, did you consider other schools? And what was it about the Big Red that made it seem like the right fit for you? Um, there really wasn't many other schools that were in consideration. I mean, uh, Coach Rowe started recruiting me back my sophomore year when he was at Princeton. And we kind of kept a close relationship through all the years. And he got the head coaching job at Cornell. And he handed that recruiting responsibility over to Coach Jakes. And then we just had a great relationship throughout the years. And I knew that was a place I wanted to be. Thanks. I'll, I'll throw the same question at you, Jimmy. Uh, yeah, I mean, I was a pretty under-recruited um, guy. Um, and when Cornell kind of called, I, after talking to the coaching staff, um, kind of hearing from them and just – learning more about the university and what my four years could look like going forward. I mean, I, I kind of fell in love with it and knew pretty quickly this was the place I wanted to be. Jimmy, how, how would you describe your team culture and how has the team been able to remain close during this time where we're all shut away? Yeah, I mean, we're, we're a super, super, super close team. Um, you know, just always hanging out on campus, when, um, whether we're in the gym or out of the gym, um, just always together. We have um, a bunch of group messages that keep us in touch right now. We're constantly communicating, joking, um, FaceTiming, Zooming, whatever it is. Um, so, yeah, I mean, we've been constantly talking through that, and we're just trying to kind of um, build a winning culture going forward. Um, I think this past year we learned a lot of really valuable lessons going towards that, and um, I'm just excited to keep keep building that culture going forward. Terrence, how about you? Any thoughts on team culture? Uh, I think to repeat off what Jimmy said, like we have a really strong culture. We are maintaining contact with each other, like through FaceTime calls and Zoom calls. I think another important thing is that a lot of the guys, like nine or 10 of us, we all live together, which the coaches may not always like, but it's good to like be around each other a lot. We come home to each other. We're around each other, like doing homework and just hanging out, playing video games. It's a great culture builder to be around guys that you like off the court. It shows when you're on the court. So I'll say that's just really big for us. So Terrence, as, as we talked about a little bit earlier in the program, the team was visited by the 88 and 2010 squads. Uh, you know, what was that like? And did you have a chance to have any meaningful conversations with any of the alumni that really stood out to you? It was great to have the 88 and uh, 2010 team there just to see like the success they had as an Ivy League program, like going into the NCAA tournament and the 2010 team getting two wins in the tournament was huge. Like it's something that I definitely strive for like in this next upcoming year. Um, uh, someone I got to talk to was Lewis Dell on the 2010 team. Just having that conversation with him was really meaningful for me. Just like talking about life after basketball and if I want to continue to play basketball in the upcoming years. And also just coming from being a point guard and having that pressure of like, having to be a leader on the team just was really informative for me. Great. Well, uh, Jimmy, one thing uh, that you were able to uh, pick up during the spring was an academic All-America honor. Uh, how are you able to balance academics with your athletic uh, athletic time and yeah. and when you're also when you're not playing basketball for Cornell what are you doing around campus yeah um, I guess just kind of as I've kind of gotten older um, 
in school uh, at Cornell, you kind of just kind of learn how to balance everything better. Um, you know, teachers are really good working with us. Um, through, they know we have a really hectic schedule, so they're really accommodating there. And um, it's just kind of been something I've always taken pride in and tried to um, really do well in. So um, a lot of focus there. And then, like you said, off the court, um, just really always doing stuff with my teammates, whether it's you know, playing video games, um, enjoying the weather and the um, beautiful outdoors in Ithaca. So usually just some along those lines. Um, yeah, making memories with my teammates. How about you, Terrence? When you're not on the hardwood, what are you doing around the hill? Library, something like that. Unlike Jimmy, I do spend a lot of time in the library. He's a, kind of a guy that does work at home. But other than that, I have, so I'm from LA, so I don't get to see many like gorgeous and things like that. So I like to spend some time there. And then just hanging out with my teammates around campus is pretty fun. So real quick, uh, when your Cornell career is done, do you have a plan yet for what comes next, Terrence? Um, I do want to continue to play basketball uh, as long as I can. I'm not sure what, what's after that, but I just want to continue to play as long as I can. Great, how about you, Jimmy? Yeah, like T said, I think I'm just going to kind of ride this this game as long as I can, um, as long as it feels right. And then after that, um, I'm, I'm in the business school, um, so I, I'm really interested in you know finance and stuff like that. So maybe later down the road, I'll get into um, something in that industry. So Great. Well, thank you both. I, I want to grab some questions from our audience. Uh, Aaron Osgood wants to know, which coach would you pick for your teammate in a two – Two-on-two game. <laughs> Do you want to go? <laughs> I'll go first. Um, I'll, I'll probably pick uh, Coach Clay Wilson. <laughs> I mean, he, I think he's the youngest out of all the coaches. And uh, in practice, he seems to compete pretty well with us. So, I guess that'll be my pick. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, Clay's definitely the youngest in the um, – he he just he just stopped playing a few years ago, so I guess that gives him the edge there. But I don't know. I might go with Earl and maybe just get him to talk, <laughs> talk some trash, get in the get in the other team's head. When we get back to school, me and T versus Jimmy and Coach, <laughs> it's on. All right. Well, thank you both. Best of luck. Uh, hope you stay safe and are able to keep sharp while you're away. And we look forward to the team and yourselves getting right back on on the hardwood at Newman Arena this fall. Late so, fall. Yes, sir. Looking forward to it. Thanks again, everyone. Thanks for having us. All right. Coach Earl, we got a few last questions coming in before we wrap up tonight uh, that I will direct towards you. Or if you want to if you want to bounce them over to another coach, that's fine. Uh, Brad also wants to know, did we lose any players we expected to come back? Uh, no, we did not. Um we're maybe a little less affected by the transfer rules uh, because of the obvious reason that you shouldn't leave here without a Cornell degree, I think. So uh, we didn't lose anyone. Great. Uh, Bob Slocum asks, would like Coach Earl's views on the potential new transfer rule and would it help or hurt Cornell if passed? Uh, so the new transfer rule in basketball is that – so it still stands that if you transfer without special situations, you will have to sit a year and then play. And basketball, football, and a couple other sports still stand that way, but the NCAA looks like they're going to change policy and make it so that you can be immediately eligible if you want to transfer one time. And so there's a bit of an uproar in, in college basketball about what that means with regard to students, student athletes just wanting to leave as soon as they face a little adversity, making bad decisions and sort of changing course. Um, I think that I, I'm on both sides of it. The, you know, the, the, the students should have, like any student, the ability to transfer um, and and play at another institution. The issue is I think you're going to start to see coaches – it's going to start to be a professional situation. Um, and so the people always think about the kids who want to transfer after having not a great experience, but I worry that coaches are going to start getting rid of kids um, 
and because they weren't as good as they thought they were. Uh, and so, you know, I'd said this in an article, I played low level professional basketball uh, and you were basically there until they didn't want you there anymore. And I'm, I'm concerned that the, the world is moving a little bit towards that, that people are going in and out and there's unintended consequences to this whole thing of that, that they're only looking at the student athlete. And I think the coaches are going to start to become a little more, um, you know, a, a little more uh, sort of, they're going to do things to, to, to make sure that their squad the following year is going to look as good as it can by taking advantage of the rule that way. Great. Thank you. Uh, Josh Gershenfeld would like to know, last year we saw new guys like Jordan play right from the get-go and others like Greg and Marcus find their roles later on. What can we expect from this incoming class in that regard? Yeah, I'm not sure. You know, it, we all, most of us were freshmen in college and it's no picnic, you know, so it, it's, it's hard just being a normal student um, and then throw into that mix a highly competitive situation. And so, uh, Jordan was thrown in early. He, he sort of made a lot of shots uh, in practice and, and got, a, got a crack at it. Um, and, and Greg and Marcus came a little bit later. And you don't know. You sort of plan for what you want to do, but everybody has a plan until they get punched in the face, Mike Tyson quote. And so we're just sort of going to come in and say, let's see what everyone can do. Um, I have a feeling that some of the guys, the upperclassmen, are going to try to hold on for dear life uh, to those minutes. So that's what you need. You need a competitive environment um, so that that we all get better as a team. And in that vein, Joshua wants to know, how do you instill toughness in a player? Huh. Can you? <laughs> um, I'm, not, I'm not sure. I mean, I think... I think, uh, you know, if anyone's watched the Jordan documentaries recently, which is sort of the biggest deal in, I guess, the basketball world, but I think in the sports world, you're seeing a lot of, of him being just relentlessly competitive. Um, and he had a coach who was basically a Zen master. And it's easy to be a Zen master when your best player will cut another guy's throat to win. So um, I... I I would love to know the formula to take a kid who's not ultra competitive and, and sort of give him a, a little extra dose. You, you do see guys get better, but a lot of that has sort of either been learned growing up or it's just the way they are. Jeff Foote is wondering if you could change something about Bartels Hall, what would it be? <laughs> um, We've done good things there, especially with the locker room. I think, you know, I, I think of both teams were were interested that in, in the picture you see the scoreboard is a little dated, um, a lot dated. I think it's we have some '88 guys on here, um, Mike Pascal and and some other guys that um, I think those are the boards they were playing under uh, in 1988. And so, you know, everything um, takes its time, but I think a new overhead scoreboard and, and sort of those end zone scoreboards would probably be the next, next thing to do. Um, that takes a lot of effort from us as a, a staff as administrators, and then, you know, alumni as well. We need to, to be able to pay for it. I, I will say our competition has, you know, put in a lot of, uh, capital into these things in the last few years. And so we, we should want to flex our muscles a little bit in this arena. And I think when recruits walk in, um, when, when alumni walk in, it'd be a nice thing to see uh, that we're, we're sort of fighting the good fight with some of our competitors there. And perhaps more shrines in honor of Jeff Foote perhaps as well. Yes. I thought I saw something about a double team that he was used to. <laughs> uh, Matt Morgan is wondering which coach is beating him in make 35. <laughs> in 1999, me. <laughs> All right. 
Uh, oh, wait. I guess a uh, question just came in from Kathy Bolks, 91. I think actually a couple people have asked this question. Uh, what is your thought about the gra graduate transfer rule and the Ivy League's unwillingness to change it? Yeah, you know, I'm not sure. I, I think we we have a certain um, – with – with us recruiting undergrads, we they have a, a good feel for us recruiting really good people, you know, and I think we've done a good job of that. I inherited really good people. Um, and so we get some help with the admissions process. Um, now at a graduate situation in the Ivy League, um, if, if, if you're putting a kid into an, a graduate um, spot in, in an Ivy League institution, you know, that that's a high, high, high level academic. So, you know, we would like, I would like to see it. I would like to be able to keep our guys, guys in this league have left because of that rule. Uh, I just think you have to navigate that, that, that you start getting into the graduate school admissions process um, and a spot where we have to fight for might be taken away from a high level academic. Okay, well, that's all the questions I see. Uh, there is a rumor going around the chat that it's actually Lewis Dale's birthday. Uh, I don't know if that's accurate or uh, they're just playing a gag on us, but if it is, happy birthday, Lewis. <laughs> happy birthday. I'm glad you got that shout out that uh, everyone enjoyed meeting you. Uh, and Stephen Appel wants to give a quick shout out to Drew Martin, 86, says he was a great competitor. Uh, well, that is the end. That was the end of our scheduled uh, program right now. I want to thank everyone for joining us. Uh, had about, I think we peaked around 90. So thanks everyone for tuning in. And I'll give uh, give Coach Earl the last word here, and then we will let you unmute and kind of shout at people that you know, or give some shout outs to the coaches or the players. Go ahead, Coach. Oh, uh, thank you. I mean, uh, we're we were excited to do this. I mean, there's a, there's not a, we're recruiting in a lot of new and different ways, which we can't talk too much specifically about recruiting, but uh, we're doing things uh, very differently because of the situation we're in. But it's, it's great to sort of get out here and see everyone and, and see the faces and, and the names and, and um, you know, the thing about having been a player and a coach for, my staff and myself and for these guys as you're excited to be a part of something that's bigger than yourself and and you you keep those relationships throughout life and so it's it's great to have everyone in here that wants to be a part of that this that that is sticking with us um that is excited hopefully about next year and and uh we miss seeing you in person but hopefully we'll, we'll get to do that soon all right, thanks coach and thanks everyone again. And if we wanna drop the screen share, uh, that will open up a lot more windows. Feel free to unmute and say hello. And outside of that, thanks everybody. Have a great night. Thanks for setting this up. Thanks guys. Thank you. Happy Keith birthday, Lou. Keith did a great job. <laughs> Thank you. Can, uh, can I give you a call? Uh, you've been in your office tomorrow. Who is that directed to? Me? Yeah, Keith. Uh, I'm not allowed in my office right now, Chris, but you're happy to give me a call or, or email me. <laughs> what, what's a good number to use? Uh, do I want to give that out of the chat? I don't know. Who's in this chat? <laughs> I'll send it to you. Direct, I'll, I'll chat it to you personally. How about that? All right, th thanks. What the hell? Thanks, everybody. Have a good night. Thanks, Coach. Thanks, guys. Yeah, I'm done. Well, he left before I could give it to him. Oh, well, I'll look him up.